love in a very cold climate, we have Orlandophages, who's going to be introduced by John Kampfner. Thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, good evening, everybody. Um, well done for uh, surviving and thriving in a whole day. We were um, doing a different session at 10 o'clock this morning, and um, so here we are at 6 o'clock um, this evening um, at the end of another fabulous day here um, at uh, the Jaipur Literary Festival. Um, the person you want to hear, for, uh, hear from is Orlando Figes, uh, the writer of uh, many books about Russia um, uh, revolving around Russia's history um, and it's very complicated history. I suppose for me, a, as a journalist who has uh, lived many years um, in what was then the Soviet Union um, and is now um, whatever you want to call it, um, the Russian Federation, um, I've always dealt with sort of big picture stuff, um, leaders, uh, ex economies, oppositions, uh, dare I say it, military coups, attacks on parliament, um, and that sort of thing. What is so remarkable about this particular work that Orlando um, has written, just send me word, is that it encapsulates all the big picture history of the worst parts of the Stalin era, but it does it through two remarkable individuals. Two individuals, one who was in the Gulag, in the north, in the very far north of Russia, in the most inhospitable and awful conditions imaginable, a fate that befell millions of people. Um, and uh, his lover, his uh, girlfriend, who uh, became, I shouldn't say, uh, his wife. Um, and it's a remarkable love story um, brought via the uh, discovering of a cache of thousands of the most intimate letters that shine a light not just on a personal relationship, but on the circumstances of his uh, imprisonment, his incarceration, and what happens thereafter. So Orlando has um, achieved a rare feat of telling history presciently and beautifully through the eyes of the two protagonists. You want to hear from Orlando, he will speak for around 30 minutes reading from the book. Um, and after that, uh, if we have time, we'll take some questions. So please give a warm welcome to Orlando Fijis. Hello, thank you for coming. Thank you for that, John. Should we have the first slide, which I can't see, but it should show you the archive. Do I point it there? I point it there. That, what can you see? I can see down there. Oh, no, can we have the first slide? No? Can we have the film? film which we loaded, please. It should show the archive. <laughs> the archive I'm going to talk about is the largest collection of private correspondence ever to come out of the Gulag. When it was discovered on its delivery to Memorial offices in Moscow, Here's the archive, can you see that? The trunk. There were three trunks, and in the smallest of them was this cache of letters. As I said, the largest known collection of correspondence ever to come out of the Gulag. When we discovered it, we did not know how much, how many letters there were, only how much it weighed, 37 kilograms. It later turned out that there were 1,246 letters exchanged between Lev Glebovich and Svetlana Alexandrovna between 1946 and 1954, when, as John said, Lev was a prisoner in one of Stalin's most notorious labor camps in the far north of Russia. What's so remarkable about this correspondence is not just its size, the biggest ever discovered. The second biggest archive of Gulag correspondence is 150 letters. This is 1,246. It is the fact that it is a complete run of letters from both sides each one carefully numbered. Now, it's one thing for a prisoner to keep letters coming into a labor camp. It's a very precious treasure. It's completely different for someone outside the labor camp to retain 
a letter from a prisoner. So we have both sides of the correspondence. You can see Lev's letter, one from Petura on the yellow paper, on, a, on the left as I see it, and Svetlana's handwriting on the right. We have both sides of the correspondence complete. That's very unusual. As you'll see, someone from in Svetlana's position to be collecting letters from a prisoner, a convicted spy, in her line of work, which was a military secret, was highly dangerous. But it's not just the size and the complete run of the correspondence that makes it special. It's the fact that these letters, almost remarkably, are completely uncensored. Between 1946 and 1954, most prisoners in most labor camps, depending on the circumstances of each camp, might write one censored letter a month with the stamp of the censor. In this correspondence, about 98% of the correspondence, as far as we can tell, was uncensored because the letters were smuggled in and out of the barbed wire zone. And that makes this correspondence extremely valuable because as the smuggling system became more secure, both Lev and Svetlana opened up and Lev wrote more and more candidly about conditions in the camp. His letters are, as far as we know, the only major real-time record of daily life inside one of Stalin's labor camps. We got hundreds of memoirs of survivors, people who years later, despite the tricks of memory and the fictionalization of the experience, wrote about the camps. But Lev's letters are the only major source we have written at the time from within the barbed wire zone, and that makes his letters extremely valuable. But for me, the most precious thing about this correspondence is neither its size or its complete run or its uncensored nature, it's the character of the two people themselves. And here they are, Lev Glebovich and Svetlana Alexandrovna Ivanova in the year they met, 1935, on the first day of the entrance exams to the physics faculty of Moscow University. At that time, probably the best physics faculty in the world. In the year below them would be Andrei Sakharov, the Nobel Prize winner. Lev came from a family of the Moscow gentry. Both his parents had been executed by the Bolsheviks in the Civil War. And he'd been brought up in Moscow by his, somebody he called his grandmother but otherwise he had no family. Svetlana came from a different sort of background, what we would call the Soviet technical intelligentsia. Her father had been an important f uh, figure in the development of synthetic rubber in the Soviet Union. I, I, like, I like a love story with a bit of rubber in it. Well, he, rubber was important because in the Soviet Union, with these extremes of temperature, it was very important to be able to develop tires for all conditions. And the Russians and then the Soviets led the way in this. They met, they began to court, parting off from their groups of friends, um, after lectures to go to the cinema perhaps and then Lev would walk Svetlana home and they would talk about love through poetry, which was the accepted medium to talk about such things. Their relationship was pretty chaste. And they weren't married when in June 1941, with the German invasion of the Soviet Union, Lev, who has had some military training at Moscow University, is called up into the university militia and eventually, in September, sent off to the front, where he's immediately captured. They just send out boys, mostly without arms, just to sort of throw bodies at the invading Germans. They've been taken by surprise. And in the encirclement of Vyazma, Lev is captured. He's taken first to a place called Katyn. Yes, exactly the same place as the Katyn massacre, where the Germans try to recruit him as a spy. He speaks German. They want to send him back to Moscow to give information to the Germans, but he refuses. And so along with another 
group of refuseniks he's sent to Germany, where he's put in a series of stalag camps and then a concentration camp, where he is forced to work as a translator, translating German propaganda for the Soviet and other Slav uh, prisoners of war. He runs away from one camp, is recaptured. He ends up at the end of the war in Buchenwald, one of the most notorious uh, German camps. And on the 12th of April, 1945, on one of the death marches out of Buchenwald, thinking they're going to a crematorium to be burned, he runs away into the forest, finds himself liberated by an American tank division. The American commander takes him to their uh, command center and he's interrogated where they try to persuade him to go to America. Just before the war, he'd been involved in a very high level area of nuclear physics research. But Lev says no, he wants to go back to the Soviet Union. He knows nothing about Svetlana. He's not heard from her for four and a half years. But all he has is there. So they repatriate him at Weimar, where the Soviets immediately arrest him, imprison him, which is what they did with all Soviet soldiers returning from German captivity, and put him through what they called filtration, which is where they interrogated him to see if he had been a collaborator, and eventually tricked him into a confession of having been a spy. And in a 20-minute trial, he's first given by the, by the military tribunal a death sentence for espionage tra treason to the motherland, which is immediately commuted to 10 years hard labor in Pechora. And he sets off in December 1945, and at the end of a long and arduous convoy, reaches Pechora in March 1946, where he joins these. This is a picture of the hauling teams at the Pechora labor camp in 1946. Pechora was um, on a very important Gulag railway development to the Varkuta coal and oil basin on the White Sea. It was important for the Soviets because if the Germans had broken through at Stalingrad and into the coal basin of the Don and the oil resources of the Caucasus, the Soviet Union would have been left without any fuel. So as the Germans attacked, the Soviets frantically built with gulag labor a railway up to the far north. If you know where the Urals are, go as far north as you can on the Urals. That is where Vakuta is. And Pechora was one of these towns on the railway development to Vakuta. And what it was doing in 1946 was it was receiving timbers, which had been cut in the Arctic forest and floated down the river Rivers only navigable up there for about three months of the year. The rest of the year, it's ice. And there, they would haul the timbers up 500 meters into the zone, the industrial zone, where they would be put first into a drying unit and then into workshops where they would be made into prefab housing and furniture for the gulag settlements. Lev worked for three and a half months in the hauling teams. If he'd worked any longer, he would have died. It's exhausting work. As soon as summer comes, you're eaten alive by mosquitoes. But one day, he's saved. He's sitting in the drying unit, and he's discovered by an extraordinary man called Georgi Strelkov, who was an old Bolshevik, who'd been one of the people developing the Kalima gold mines in the far northeast of Siberia, but had been arrested for trying to save prisoners by sending them food. They said, what are you sending out new food for them? Emptied the ships of food and put onto the ships new prisoners. There's no point feeding dying prisoners. Strelkov was given 25 years, but he was so important for the Gulag development that he was allowed to live in the laboratory of the drying unit. We'll see a picture of it in a minute. And there, he could wear a suit, he could grow vegetables, tomatoes, even flowers under the heated glass. He would 
uh, distilled vodka in the flasks, and he would help his friends. And one of his friends was to be Lev, because he spotted in him, as a physicist, a man of science whom, who might be useful to the running of the power station. So first he's given a job in the drying unit. That saves him. Then he's transferred to the electrical team running the power station. It's a very primitive power station. Lev's never run a power station before. He doesn't know how to handle high, high voltage cables, but that's the gulag. That's how it works. It's very primitive. Once he is in the power station, he has the first opportunity to write. He's dry. He can get hold of paper and pens. And here is Lev in the laboratory, writing. When he was at Weimar, he had pledged not ever to write again to Svetlana. He had given hope of all hope of ever seeing her. You must understand that after these years of imprisonment, a prisoner loses self-belief. If he writes to someone who may or may not have been waiting for him, it may well be a burden to her. He didn't want to burden her. She may be married. But he lost his willpower to resist and wrote, not to Svetlana, but to someone he called Aunt Olya. She wasn't an aunt. She was a distant relative in Moscow, and he asked after Svetlana. And three or four weeks later, he goes to the barracks uh, letter collection department and he sees a letter for him in his, her, Svetlana's handwriting. So she's alive, obviously. She's not married, it seems. She spent the years of the war in evacuation and then returned to Moscow in 1943 to work at her father's institute developing as an industrial physicist developing synthetic rubber. And she writes to him, Lev can't believe it. He paces around outside. It's the 8th of August. It doesn't get dark that far north, so he doesn't need electric light to read the letter over and over again. And at 5 a.m. the next day, he writes this in reply. Sveta, Svet, can you imagine what I'm feeling now? I can't put a name to it or measure the happiness I feel. The 8th has always been an important date in my life. You see, I've become a fatalist, and now it has become a joyful date. I went to get the letters for our block and was not at all jealous of those who received letters because I didn't expect anything for myself. I had got a letter from Aunt Olya on the 31st and didn't expect anything else until the start of September, and then suddenly, my surname, and as if it were alive, your handwriting. For three years, I had managed to keep safe a tiny scrap of paper with your handwriting. It was all I had of you, until it was confiscated in the full search at Buchenwald on the 3rd of July, 1944. I lived with the hope that you were still alive and that I'd see you again. But on your last birthday, which I celebrated at a difficult moment in the interrogation, I resigned myself to saying goodbye to you. I carried on denying myself any hope, not only of our ever meeting again, but even of my ever hearing anything about you. Sveta, if you could only imagine, understand what an interrogation really is, it's not just a question of the physical suffering. I never experienced those, but what it feels like in the soul. Did you know that there's something worse than death? It's mistrust but I'm getting off the point. And so anyway, I said goodbye to you, but I couldn't hold out without you. Eight months later, I wrote a letter to Aunt Olya just on the off chance without much hope, and I asked her about you. And then on the anniversary of that foolish day on the 31st of July, 1936, when I nearly drowned and had to be pulled out of the Istra on my way to see you in Boriskova, I was saved again. I had never expected such an affectionate, warm-hearted, a maternal letter. In fact, I hadn't expected a letter at all. Aunt Olga wrote all about you. You. Alive. So, the correspondence begins, haltingly at first, and 
Then he finds a way to make the smuggling of letters possible. And I hadn't actually been able to work out how that could be just from a correspondence. This book couldn't have been written without A, going to Pechora and interviewing people there, and B, discovering or managing to get hold uh, of the MVD, the NKVD, that's the KGB archive of the labor camp where Lev was a prisoner. And from these sources, it became clear how the smuggling could work, because the zone, the industrial zone behind barbed wire is about the size of a small village, or a large village, maybe the size of the Jaipur Literary Festival type zone. But within it, there was a separate settlement where former prisoners, now free workers, lived. They had nowhere to go at the end of their sentence. They felt a great deal of solidarity with the prisoners, quite clearly. Some of them lived outside, but would come into the zone, they had a pass. So they could smuggle letters in and out. There was one, for example, you might wonder, how do we get all these pictures of prisoners inside the gulag? We've got hundreds of them from this archive. And they were all taken by a keen amateur photographer, a free worker, a former prisoner. They call him the namesake in the correspondence because his name is Lev Israelovich. He lived outside the zone. He was a repairman so he could come into the industrial zone, and a keen photographer. So Svetlana would send in a package some photographic materials for Lev Israelovich and letters and whatever else she wanted to get to Lev. Eventually, she's sending all sorts of things, not just for Lev, but for other prisoners to help them, medicines, vitamins, and everything like that. And Lev Israelovich would go into the zone, letters smuggled in, his clothing, meet Lev at the laboratory, which you see, or come to see him at the power station, and take letters from Lev to Svetlana out of the zone, and then post to her through the normal post. Lev's letters from Svetlana he stored under the plank in his barracks, and then when he had a cache of them, he would smuggle them in his clothing to the laboratory, where Strelkov could protect the letters and any other precious, valuable items. And then when a free worker was exiting or going to Moscow even, they would take the package out and Svetlana would keep the materials. But to, as I said before, to store such, such letters was a huge risk for her. She was working in an area of industrial physics which was deemed a military secret. Anyway, the correspondence develops and as it does, the nature of Lev's writing in particular becomes more candid. You might have noticed in that first letter how he says, you know, I didn't get beaten or tortured in the interrogation. It's not true, he did. And in the early correspondence, he's censoring himself very much. He doesn't want to cause anxiety or to be a source of worry to Svetlana. But they do, he does begin to open up. And he reveals much more about the gulag than I think we ever knew before. For example, some of the psychological aspects that don't come out in the, in the memoir material. His anxiety about falling ill for obvious reasons. And there's no doctors there. Uh, the anxiety of, I think his greatest fear in many ways is the fear of being sent on a convoy. We can't understand what a convoy means. But for him, a convoy would mean that if he was singled out for punishment, which was, it could happen at any time, a guard takes a like, dislike to you. He might bully you and then uh, find some reason to punish you. It would mean first going to colony number three, which is not for politicals. He's in colony number two for politicals. It's in colony number three for criminals. Pretty hard living with criminals. They're brutal. They can murder and get away with it. And then if he, create, uh, if he uh, breaks rules once again or whatever, he can be then sent on a convoy. That means he'll lose everything because he's marched in convoy into a remote forest colony to fell timber where he may not survive, where food may not come, and where above all he'll lose contact with Svetlana. So these sort of things do come out of the correspondence, and I'll return to one of them towards the end. Uh, Svetlana's letters, for him, 
are giving him hope. Do you remember he said in that first letter, there's something worse than death, it's mistrust. Harder than the physical hardships for a prisoner, in many cases, may well be the psychological ones, the sense that no one believes me anymore, no one is waiting for me. What Svetlana does for Lev is to give him hope to carry on. And that comes out in uh, one of Svetlana's letters. It's one of my favorites, actually. This is what she writes to him. Lev, I have always believed in you, in everything. It was so before, has been all these years, and is still the case now. It's true, no one can vouch for the future. Yet even now I believe in our future, though I cannot picture it clearly to myself. All that matters is that we can be together. As for everything else, I think I've become wise enough not to let anything trivial or beyond our control spoil the most important thing. Oh, Levy, oh, where should I go from? Yeah. Uh, you know, Levy, not so long ago, during a conversation about life in general, about its difficulties and hardships, a girl said that I was the happiest of them all. She meant because the two of us haven't yet spoilt things for ourselves or for each other. When others spoil it for you, it's not so bad. And I didn't protest. It's true, Levy. They don't have you, which means they cannot be the happiest. So there you are. It's confirmed by logic and dialectics. People have tried to prove to me so many times in words and deed that a loving couple cannot be happy in a hovel unless it's insulated and equipped with limitless electricity and gas and other such comforts. But I haven't given up yet, Levy. I would only need to see that you are there when I wake up in the morning and then in the evening to tell you everything that had happened in the day, to look into your eyes and hold you close to me. A fine only, isn't it? For the time being, it would be enough simply to receive your tenth letter. The point of all of this is that I want to tell you just three words. Two of them are pronouns, and the third is a verb to be read in all the tenses simultaneously, past, present, and future. It's a wonderful love letter, a declaration of love, but she doesn't use the word. In fact, she uses it very, very rarely. I think that's partly in her character, maybe. She didn't like any element of sentiment. There might be something in her scientific background. I mean, she talks about losing H2O, H2O when she cries. It's proved by logic and dialectics we've heard in that letter. But I think it's above all because when they're living separated as they are for so long, to burden the other with the knowledge of the other's love is, is also something they wouldn't want to do to the other. They want to unburden their love onto each other. Lev was, as you might imagine, more demonstrative. He's sitting there pining, wondering what Svetlana is up to, I suppose, a lot of the time. And in this letter, he's uh, discussing with her the passing of time, an obvious theme. Much of the correspondence is a conversation of this type. And I'd like to read you this letter, because I think it shows you something of Lev's character, as well as their relationship. I look at the people around me in the camp, all of them living in circumstances and surroundings so different from what they were used to once. Their spiritual outlook has changed beyond recognition. This is not a matter of aging of changes a person must go through with age, it would be bad if they didn't. You once said, and quite correctly, you were sitting at your table with principles or thermodynamics, I've forgotten exactly, but I remember it was evening and a table lamp was buzzing and I was standing near the piano, that without changing over time, people would not become themselves. What can I say about you, Svetushka? That I see you every day, that I know how you used to be and how you are now, and that although I will regret every graying hair on your head, although every additional crease in the corners of your eyes will hurt me, these things must occur. And when they do, they will not take anything away from you. 
how I feel about you. They will only add something, something new, but yours. Does it really matter if this is called old age? You are my world and always will be. And whatever you were for me, you will always be my Svet, my light. Svet, Svet lawyer in Russian means light. So he often plays on that association. And I think that's exactly what she is for him. What is Sveta doing all this time? She's living in Moscow. She's got two aging parents. She is getting up early, traveling a long way across the capital to work in her research institute, after work, standing in long queues uh, with not much more than the average wage for deficit foodstuffs in mainly empty shops, then hurrying home, looking after her parents, and writing late at night to Lev. She makes careful drafts of everything she writes and keeps one draft. So it's a very careful composition she's making for him. She's also getting parcels together. And this is um, a bone of contention between them because Lev's always saying to her, don't send me anything. I don't want food, I don't need it, it's not bad here. I'm doing okay, the food's okay. Don't send me video. He knows what a burden it is for her to go running around trying to find goods in empty shops to send to him. He says, just send me a book or two and maybe a manual on how to run this power station. Something on electrical engineering might help. Uh, but she does go around the shops collecting stuff for him. And as I said, not just for Lev, but for his fellow prisoners. We can see some of them, I think, in the next slide. Yes, here we have Lev, the back row on the right, with Strelkov, the head of the laboratory I mentioned. And in front of him, Nikolai Lileyev, we'll come back to him. He, Nik Lileyev, who's still alive, came on the same convoy as Lev from Weimar. And next to him, another prisoner called Litvinenko. So she, what's interesting, it's not, a, not a, just a love story. This is about love and solidarity because Svetlana is sending medicine. Strelkov is, is ill. Lev's sending symptoms, his symptoms to Svetlana, and she's going to doctor friends and saying what could be wrong with him and sending out drugs and diagnoses so that Strelkov can be cured. And so on. There's a whole network of of relationships developing through this correspondence whereby the families of Lev and his friends can get together and um, through Svetlana's coordination, medicines, letters, all sorts of help can come to these prisoners. That's what's also interesting about this story. Anyway, uh, she goes off looking for um, uh, things for Lev's parcels and he tells her not to do so. And she says, don't talk nonsense, we're doing it. And uh, she has a tremendous sense of humor, Svetlana. And I think it comes through in this letter. As for the parcels, don't try to stop them. For us at the moment, it's the only thing that brings any kind of satisfaction. All the others in our lives may be necessary, but they don't bring any kind of joy. Mama has asked me to tell you what was in the parcel that was sent on the 20th. Here's the list. A white shirt, warm socks, lined trousers, a towel and headscarf, soap, toothpaste, a brush and comb, slippers, thread and buttons, two tins, up to a kilogram of tinned food and a box of chocolates with strange packaging, as I told you, but Papa insisted on it because of the rats, paper and a textbook, pencils, pen and ink, glucose and ascorbic acid, vitamin C to the unenlightened, eat it for God's sake. Svetlana and Lev managed not only to smuggle letters in and out of the labor camp, Svetlana smuggled herself into the labor camp. This is completely unprecedented in the chronicles of Gulag history. There's legends about people breaking into labor camps. But in this correspondence, We've managed to locate the dates and some detective workers, ma we've managed to work out how she managed to smuggle herself into the labor camp, not once, not twice, but four times. I'm not going to tell you how, you're going to have to buy the book. 
to find out. But essentially, how it worked was that she, it was different on each occasion, but as an industrial physicist, she was a, a charged with inspecting factories, producing tires connected with her research institute. And she would go off and then send a telegram to her boss, who was a friend of the family and knew about her correspondence, uh, put on a military uniform for disguise, and take a huge risk by traveling illegally to Petura, and then actually on the first occasion with the help of that AMA photographer, Lev Israelovich, basically talked her way into the camp. And here's a picture of her. After her first visit, the morning after, she spent a whole night with Lev in the house of one of the voluntary workers. And was smuggled out the next morning and there she is at Lev Israelovich's house at Kozhva. Uh, the houses up that far north, they bury into the ground to protect against the wind. I think she looks exhausted but very happy on her way back to Moscow. Four times she does this. On the fifth occasion and the last occasion, she manages to visit Lev legally. She had no rights to go to uh, Pechora to apply for a visit. M mothers and wives could apply for a visit. But Svelana is not a wife. She's just a girlfriend from university. She has no legal right to apply. However, by 1951, the date of her last visit, the Gulag administration is looking for ways to incentivize uh, the laborers. They're building a second line between Pechora and Varkuta. And so they're beginning to pay gulag prisoners for their labor. That's a disaster for the gulag. I, I quickly worked out from the archives because as soon as money came in and they opened a little kiosk for prisoners to buy things, the, more or less the only thing you could buy was vodka. Uh, so the guards became more drunk and the whole thing became more chaotic, uh, more corrupt, but that's another matter we could perhaps discuss at question time. After 1951, she is unable to make any more visits because their parents are too sick. Uh, so they live entirely for each other through their correspondence. Two more minutes, yeah? I'm going to finish. And from this last letter, before I wrap up, I think we can see some of the effects of the camp on Lev. One of the worst things for a prisoner is to see the human degradation that goes around among other prisoners. It might happen to you. Here he is in his last year of incarceration with Lilaev. And he's in this correspondence with Svetlana talking with her about how if he's ever released and if they ever manage to live together and have children, what sort of father might he be? He's worried about that. She's worried about what sort of mother and wife she will make. And they're discussing pedagogy really, how to bring up children. And Lev writes this, physical strength is the most necessary condition in life. Those parents who aren't making their children develop physically, whether they want to or not, should be subject to punishment. At any rate, physical development should play a far larger role than is mandated in schools. It's a crime that Nikolai Lilayev, who is nearly twice as tall as me, is no better than I am at weightlifting, and that in a fight only his height would be of any advantage. To look at him, you would have thought him strong enough to play Goddard's key, a kind of skittles with telegraph poles. Well, Lev's fears were for nothing, because in July 1954, he was finally released, not allowed to return to Moscow. So he settled in a village, was not able to find work. Svetlana smuggled him translating work. He occasionally went to visit her illegally in Moscow. And then in 1955, under the Adenauer amnesty, which uh, um, liberated people convicted of collaboration with the Germans. Lev was finally allowed to return to Moscow and live there, at which point, and only at that point, did they decide to get married. They registered their marriage. The girl in the registry office said, I wouldn't marry him if I were you because it showed in his passport he'd been a prisoner. Svetlana says, don't worry, just put him down as my husband. And shortly afterwards, they have the first of their children, Anastasia, and then two years later, Nikita. 
Lev found it difficult to find work, but did eventually return to the world of physics. Not high-level nuclear physics between 1941 and 1956, the world of nuclear physics had moved on a little bit, but he was able to return as a lab assistant at the physics research unit of Moscow University, where he worked for the next 34 years. He retired, and in the 2000s, began to give interviews to Memorial, the human rights organization, about his time in Germany. And in the course of this, mentioned his letters. He'd never really thought about his, these letters as having historical significance. But in the course of giving these interviews, he thought perhaps they were of interest. And in 2007, they, uh, Memorial persuaded the Mission Coast to give their entire family archive to Memorial in those three big trunks, which I then discovered in the offices of Memorial the, the, virtually the day after they were delivered. I wanted to get the letters transcribed, obviously, because although they're written in tiny handwriting, as you've seen, and are uncensored, it's difficult to work out all of their meanings. There's things, it, meanings alluded to, names and only initials. So I wanted to get them transcribed so we could go and ask Levin Svetlana. And in March 2008, we I took a little crew, a, a BBC uh, a development funded crew, to film some interviews with them. So I want to close with that interview. Can we have the film? It could have the sound up. <laughs> впечатление от вас, когда вы познакомиться. His truthfulness, he can be believed, he's a truthful person, he can be believed. And she says, yeah, the trouble is I can't work out why I believed him in the first place. But then she says, as soon as I met him, I knew he was the one for me. Uh, shortly after this interview, Lev Glebovich died. Svetlana Alexandrovna died in January 2010, and they're buried side by side in Moscow. I'll close there. Thanks very much indeed, Orlando. A, a, a fascinating talk. Um, loads of questions I would love to ask you, but um, uh, given that I think the audience has got much better questions and I don't want to hog, let's go straight to uh, questions from, from the audience. We've got time for a few. Yeah, uh, right here in the, in the middle. Is there another one to follow? We'll wait Hello. and see. Hi, yeah. uh, I wanted to ask how did you come upon these letters in the first place? Uh, how did you discover them? <coughs> yeah, I was making a radio program about a previous oral history project I'd done with Memorial and other organizations um, and simply went to do an interview with the interviewers in Moscow for this radio program, which is available. Uh, and uh, they said, yeah, well, this stuff has just come in. And it was these three big trunks literally taking up most of the office. I think there's one just, um, just there was, yep, just there, yeah, next to you. And then, and then here in the middle. Uh, Professor Fajis, um, pleasure to hear you again in such surroundings, rather than the uh, Sealy Library of, gosh, 20 years ago. Oh, yeah. um, your ability to move from the Russian Revolution in your first book to the Cinder love story in this one suggests to me a comparison with a great sweep of the classic Russian novelists. 
of the 19th century. Are they a model for your approach to narrative history? No, I don't think so. Um, I mean, obviously, I would like... I mean, I, this book, I think, is something that could be read as a novel. And believe me, there was a temptation to novelize it or to in, build up the emotions of it. But firstly, everything had to be checked by memorial for accuracy and then run by the family. And I was feeling very strongly that, you know, that it would completely spoil it to invent anything. Or even to write uh, sentences that, you know, could say must have, this must have had, speculating in any way. So everything is footnoted and it's completely factual and documented. And so while one might be inspired by no novelists, um, while one's, um, while my sort of sense of storytelling m might bear the influence of the novelists, um, I would shudder at the thought that there's anything novelistic in the book in that sense. Yeah. Uh, those here in the middle. Yep. Just there in the middle. And who's next after the person here? And there's one there again in the side. Oh, that was a very interesting talk. Uh, I just wanted to ask you, considering how much you rely on the letters written in this book, what do you see the future of this kind of writing as being, considering that we don't rewrite letters anymore and, you know, it's the communication has become almost entirely based on technology recently. So what do you think writers in the future, if they want to do this kind of work, would have to rely on? What would their material be? Well, it's a, you know, it's a complete one-off to find um, an archive of letters of this richness. It's, it's a, it's a once-in-a-very-lucky-lifetime find. Um, so there's not going to, I don't think there's a genre of epistolary hi, his, history writing in that sense that is likely to develop. Occasionally, if someone else is as lucky as I have been, they will find letters too. I think, you know, that there, that there were huge problems with these letters. I mean, like, even, even, you know, after the fourth reading, and, you know, they took up a whole trunk, a whole, um, you know, filing, transcribed a complete filing cabinet. After the fourth reading, you know, there was still so much that couldn't be worked out. So it, 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 couldn't, it could never be based just on the letters. I don't think you could write a book like this just on the letters. You, you had to have the rich archive of the, of the labor camp itself. Um, so, you know, letters, it's, it's interesting. I mean, uh, in one of the other um, venues just now, there's Andrea de Robion talking um, about his work. And one of his earlier books is, is based on, on love letters in, in Venice in the 17th century. But he said, even Andrea had to, to work with um, lots of other supplementary material. Letters, letters aren't as revealing as you might think because they're full of mundane things or they are, they are full of lists. I need this, this, this. Or they are uh, full of, sort of references that you cannot possibly get, even if the, the people writing them were, were able to it, sort of give you interviews about them. I don't think... If, you know, sadly, Lev and Svetlana were both dead by the time the transcriptions had been made. But if I had gone to them and asked them, could you explain this, they probably would only have been able to explain about 5% of the things I couldn't understand. So I can't see a, f a future genre of sort of epistolary history writing in this way. There's going to be a one-off, but when you get a treasure like this, you have to do a, an awful lot of detective work around it. Yeah, just there. Um, would you say the story kind of got to you personally over the, la over the course of the last couple of years? Yeah, no, it's, it was a wonderful story to work with. Um, a, a undoubtedly very uplifting story to work with. Um, I think um, it was, you know, it was, it's, I think having spent so much of my career working in the darker uh, corners of Soviet history, um, the Whisperers was, was a project that was very depressing to work with. Um, it was wonderful to be able to work with a story that, it doesn't have a completely happy ending, but, by, but overall it has a happy ending, and it, it's an uplifting story. So I found, uh, I learned an awful lot about, not just the gulag, but about you know, love and about human relations through this story. And so that was a huge privilege, yeah. 
time for a couple more questions. Maybe we'll go do them two together in, in the same row. Even the you mentioned that the letters were all very carefully numbered and sorted. Um, did you have any insight as to, as to uh, presumably Svetlana did that? Uh, and Lev, yes. And Lev. And did, and did they have some um, idea of their historical importance? What was the reason for doing it, which they the, then, the, as you the, say, the, forgot about them? The practical reason for numbering them is uh, so that you know whether you're missing one. Because if number 37 arrives and then number 39 arrives, what's happened to 38? So that's the practical reason for it. I don't think, I think they literally saw them as precious treasures of their private life. I don't think they were, there's no, uh, although it's quite extraordinary to this story and even more extraordinary to live this story and archive it at the same time, I don't think there was any sense on either part of archiving this story for the sake of posterity. Um, and, you know, Lev gave several years of interviews to Memorial about his years in Germany. He wrote a memoir about his years in Germany. And at no point did he refer to this correspondence. So it was only when he began to reflect on his life historically that uh, reluctantly he was persuaded that they might be of interest to others. And then just you here. Hello. Hello, Hello, sir. Uh, do you someday plan to make a film about it? I'm sorry? Do you someday plan to make a film about the book? The film? A film, film, yeah. Um, I'm open to offers, but there's, not, <laughs> there's nothing so far. Because we would like to see, we would love to see the film. It, I, well, th there is an interest at the moment, but you know, it's, if in the world of film, it's, it's always about like buying a lottery ticket. It, who knows? I doubt very much anything will happen, but it could be a film, who knows? Well, there's an open offer to all filmmakers um, here or around the world to, um, to snap up the film. Thank you all very much um, for your attention, and before you go off and enjoy your evening, let's have a big warm uh, round of applause for Orlando Paisi. <laughs> Thank you so much for this lovely evening, especially